My guest today is Tammy Nemeth. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast, Tom. It's such a pleasure. Um, I'm a historian by training, um, but I've been living in Europe. I, I trained in Canada, but I've been living in Europe since 2003. And um, it's kind of funny that I say I'm a historian because when I speak to my British friends, they said, oh, well, so what exactly in history did you do? And I said, well, you know, Canada-US oil and gas relations since the end of World War II up until the Free Trade Agreement of 1988. And they said, oh, that's not history. That's politics. <laughs> so uh, yes, I'm a historian by training, but um, my area of expertise is oil and gas relations. And of course, doing North American stuff, you have to do globally because there's so many international events that interact and impact what those North American things are. Um, and so now I work as a, a research consultant um, where I do bespoke um, research projects for people when they, they want to understand something. They ask me to, to provide a, an assessment and analysis. And so that's what I do. Excellent. And as we were saying before we fired up the recording, uh, I just spent a lot of time reading your op-eds and your counting carbon molecules report. And uh, it's just great work. So I compliment you on what you've done. I think it's very important work. Uh, should we start with the counting carbon molecules? You want to talk about what that is and what what you uh, what you revealed there? Sure. Um, so if I could just situate that in a little bit of context, there's been this movement towards environmental social governance or ESG. And as we heard Larry Fink say last week, he no longer wants to use that term because it's getting a bad reputation. So he's still gonna do it. He's just gonna call it something else. Um, but so what this International Sustainability Standards Board did was they're, they're starting a global baseline or what they call a new global language of ESG financial disclosures. And what that means is that companies will have to account for all kinds of things up and down their supply chain, their emissions, um, various social and governance aspects that um, that will go into this global baseline. And if they can get every country to sign on to it, these major corporations will have to report on these things and investment money can flow to where it's desired by um, the likes of Larry Fink. So they would prefer that hydrocarbon companies don't get as much funding and they want to divert that to renewable energy such as wind and solar and various other trendy um, companies kind of thing and to move that investment away from there. And so what these financial disclosures do is that previously you could write your ESG report or your sustainability report or your uh, corporate social responsibility report, whatever. Um, but you weren't held liable for what you said in there. So you could say, well, we have these targets, we're moving along in this direction, um, but you weren't held financially liable. But these new standards mean that you will be held financially liable for any of those statements or projections or predictions on what you think you're going to be doing. Whatever you predict, you better do because you could be held financially liable for it. And one of the interesting things about this new standard is that they want designated individuals from on the board who are responsible for the different ESG categories and reporting so that they'll know who they can target. And the, the um, environmental NGOs tried this with Shell this year. So they put um, they did a personal liability court case against Shell board members for not moving quickly enough on their climate plans. And fortunately, the UK court said, no, you can't do that. And they threw it out. But I think what the, the ENGOs will do is they'll just reword it and try another jurisdiction. They'll shop it around to see if they can find companies personally responsible for not doing enough. So it's kind of a win for the good guys, isn't it? That Larry Fink doesn't want to say ESG anymore. I think that's fabulous news. He's going to call it well, something else. I think it's it's a pyrrhic victory because all they'll do is the people like Larry Fink and who support him, they'll just change the, the language. So people will think, okay, it's not ESG anymore, but it is. They're just going to call it something else. And whether it's sustainability reporting or 
the phrase he was throwing around was conscientious capitalism. So it's like, okay, but it's still the same metrics. It's still the same thing. And I can see with the International Sustainability Standards Board, um, maybe they'll just reword it as sustainability. Um, so it, it, it'll be interesting to see what the United States does, because perhaps you're aware last year, the Securities Exchange Commission put out a call for comment on wanting to do climate disclosures um, through the SEC. And they got loads of comments and feedback, which said, whoa, 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 hold on, what are you guys doing? This isn't an appropriate move for uh, the securities exchange people. So they said, okay, well, we'll take into account these comments. Then they reopened it in October, November, because apparently they lost some comments and they were supposed to issue their new standards this spring, but it's been postponed until the fall. So I don't know what's going on in the United States sector, but the EU has adopted some very broad disclosures, um, which are based on what the ISSB is doing. And Canada is talking about um, making them mandatory in Canada. But the Canadian companies are like, well, if the United States isn't doing it, this is going to put us at a competitive disadvantage. And uh, we're not sure that this is a good thing for, for Canadian companies. So we'll see what, what happens with that. I think one of the headlines in one of your op-eds was beware of warrior accountants, I think you said. So there's this ISSB board, it's 14 people, and they're making up all yeah. this stuff. They're unelected people. It's, the whole thing seems entirely crazy to me. Am I wrong? Right. I mean, this is what's frightening is that there was a there was a group that had established a lot of this framework before the Glasgow conference, and they'd been working on it a long time. I was just listening to when they merged with the ISSB. And the, the one thing the one lady um, said, if I could just um, briefly quote her, she said, as Thomas Friedman described, we were the revolutionary bureaucrats in the back office using imagination and commitment as the currency of value. So this is how a lot of these accountants people are thinking of themselves. They're thinking them of themselves as warriors who are going to be constructing this framework behind the scenes that everyone will be forced to do. And they were very clear that everybody has to do this. Ryan Moynihan, who's the head of the Bank of America, um, last year he said, it's absolutely crucial that we get this into accounting because everybody will have to do it. And it has to be on the financial records because that's how you hold people accountable. So you're going to have these accountants setting up this, um, this framework, these standards, and the politicians can say, well, it's not us. These professionals have put this together. The professionals are recommending these standards. And we're just saying, okay, yeah, that's a great idea. We should have our our companies do that, which will, the way that they're structured, as I describe in my report, is that it very much discriminates against fossil fuel companies. Um, I'll give you an example. One of, the, one of the issues there is that companies will have to account for, if you're an exploration and production company, you'll have to account for the greenhouse gas warming potential of your reserves. So it's not even what you're currently producing, but what you might be able to produce. And during the discussions of the ISSB board, when they were looking at the drafts, they said, so what's the difference between proved and probable? I think we should just include it all. And I'm thinking, How could, what? So probable is you're not even sure, but now companies will have to take that into account and they'll have to provide what their emissions accounting is for things that they may not even be able to extract, but it'll be on their books. And when banks are saying, okay, we can only have so much emissions on our, on our books. And so you company, you're saying you're gonna have all of these emissions from your proved and probable reserves. I'm sorry, I, we're gonna have to cut you off. We, we won't be able to fund you because you've got too many emissions. So, this is my point about the, the banks will be more concerned about if somebody is a, an emissions risk, a carbon risk, versus a financial risk. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Brian Moynihan. I have a quote at WEF 2022, quote, the bar uh, if which you're below 
people shouldn't invest in, people shouldn't be lent to. So they're going to cut you off, as you said. Um, and if you have oil reserves, that can be looked at as a negative because uh, the oil that you have is going to cause bad weather in 2100. Therefore, it's a, some sort of a liability. I, I can't Absolutely. believe people are buying this. Yeah. People, well, are they? Yeah, yeah. people are, Debbie, but it, it, unfortunately, it's the executives in charge of the big banks and the and and the and the institutional investors because this year at Davos there was a conversation between the head of the Norwegian uh, pension fund and Mark Carney, and the Norwegian guy said almost the exact same thing as Brian Moynihan. People are just going to have to learn that if they're not doing the right thing, if they have too many emissions, they're just going to be cut off. There will be no financing. They will have no investors. And he said, rightly so. And I thought, really? So you would prefer people to be freezing in the dark than you know, being investing in a hydrocarbon company. Uh, there's this uh, quote that the Chai Girl quoted out about a Glencore chief said that European investors are too focused on ESG, that New York may be a more attractive place to invest because U.S. investors are more pragmatic. Uh, I think uh, there might be more and more of that type of thinking that investment might flee from places that are too crazy about this uh, ESG stuff. You know, that's a good point. And that's why they've been so keen to establish the International Sustainability Standards Board, because they want this implemented in every country. So you can't escape it. You can't find a better jurisdiction. And so, for example, the Securities Exchange Commission is on the jurisdictional working group of the ISSB so that they can find a way to align their whatever standards the SEC is going to bring in in the United States. It will be in alignment with what is going on in um, internationally. But the problem, of course, is that the United States is, is not a unitary state. You've got individual states that have a lot of power that can say, you know what, that's not right. We don't think that's the way it should be working. And there's been resistance. Um, but if the United States falls in that direction, then there will be very little, uh, very few places that countries or investors could actually escape to, to find a way to not have to comply with these ridiculous standards, the way they're constructed anyway. ISSB is the International Sustainability Standards Board. And it's pretty new, right? It's something that just sprung on us. Nobody voted for it. Is it Right. Years old. So it it came out of COP26, which was the Glasgow meeting in 2021. And it came under the International Found, um, Financial Reporting Standards Foundation, or IFRS. The IFRS has been around since around 2000, where they would try to come up with these global accounting standards so that global companies going from one jurisdiction to another would all understand that they were working on the same page, right? So if you have these accounting standards in Germany and that they're IFRS, it would be the same as the IFRS ones in Canada. So it was really designed for big corporations that were operating around the world, but it's almost like mission creep. So now that they've done all of these different standards, they want sustainability ones. And they set up the International Sustainability Standards Board, which took as its basis the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, which is the TCFD, all these acronyms, I know it's really annoying, um, but the TCFD was set up after the Paris Agreement, and that was a project of Mark Carney, Mike Bloomberg, Mary Shapiro is the one who's kind of running it, um, and so they, they're the ones who kind of came up with this idea that they really need to, if they want to make the Paris Agreement work and shift investment, they need to get into the financial services sector to take to to restructure the banking system to divert investing money into the 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 areas that they believe are the what we need for net zero and when i say they i mean the people like mark carney like brian moynihan the ones who are in charge larry fink um the J jamie demon all those guys who are in charge of the really big banks and investing companies and so on. And as a shorthand, I use they <laughs> because there's lots of different individuals involved in it, but that's who I mean. So you had this great example of what a potato farmer might have to do to uh, figure out how much bad weather a potato is going to cause. So he, 
I guess you have to report on how is the potato going to get to the store? How did the person who bought it travel to the store where it was bought? Is it baked in an oven? Is it peeled? Is it washed? What happens to the peels? Is it boiled? Is it fried? Or is it cooked on a fire? What did the person do with the bag in which the potato came? And so on. So you're supposed yeah. to figure this stuff out. Uh, there's no way this is going to fly in the real world, right? They're going to push this through. They're going to try. But is it going to happen? Well, I I, I believe it's going to happen. It's yeah. um, Australia said they're going to be adopting it. Um, New Zealand has already made climate disclosures mandatory. The UK is considering implementing the ISSB standard or doing a little bit of a tweak on it. Canada will do it. Um, the Europeans have their own, and it's more onerous than what the ISSB is doing. So they've taken it a step further. So you have lots of the Western countries doing it. Um, oh, I should add Japan. Japan is going to do it. So they'll make it mandatory for fiscal year 2024, um, and the Europeans are phasing it in. So for the first year, if you're a company that has more than 500 employees and, and uh, revenues of however many tens of millions, then it'll apply to you. And as the years go on, um, the bar gets lower. So you would, then it, it, until eventually it's everybody. And the way that the, it's designed to work is that these big companies, because it's everything up and down your supply chain, they'll they'll pull along or or push along the smaller companies who are supplying something to that big corporation. So if you make that little widget, you're going to have to have all of the emissions involved in creating that widget to sell to that big company. And um, I, I gave a presentation to some. Uh, livestock producers or stock growers, so in the in the in the cattle industry, and so when I say up and down the supply chain, there's there's three different scopes of emissions. Scope one is all the emissions that come from your operation that you're directly responsible for, that that you can account. So the operation of your equipment, how you're looking after your cows, so whatever emissions your cows have done, and so on. Scope two is the energy that you're using. So if you're dealing with a public utility of some kind, your, your electrical producer, your natural gas producer, um, whoever's supplying you with that energy, whatever their emissions are. And then scope three is everything else. So, and I mean everything. So with the potato thing, the same thing with the cattle, where if you're, if you're getting feed, what are the emissions embedded in that feed that you're using? If you are using fertilizer, what is the um, emissions involved in that fertilizer? When your cattle gets taken to market, you have to account for all the emissions involved in taking that cattle to market. When it's being going to uh, an abattoir, the emissions involved in that, the trucking, the shipping, the packaging, um, then to the store, the refrigeration, the, um, the consumer purchasing, that beef at the store, so your steak or whatever, um, the packaging involved in that, the transport of it, the cooking of it, the disposal of it, so end of life of that steak, <laughs> which is hilarious. But basically for a lot of the scope three stuff, it's estimates. And so how are you estimating these things? Well, some big sort of NGOs will come up with estimates and then people will be like, okay, well, I guess I have to use that estimate. But eventually people will say, well, those estimates are overestimating. Wouldn't it be better if we had better tracking of this stuff? And so if you bring it down to individuals, because the banking industry will not just be looking at the bottom line for emissions of the companies they're dealing with, it's everything on their books, including mortgages, auto insurance, your personal banking. So they'll want to know the emissions profile of you as an individual consumer. And then that data can be wrapped up and used to have a more granular aspect of the estimates that everybody else is using to do all this other stuff. And what's, what's really terrible is that there's multiple counting going on. So someone's scope one is someone else's scope three. And that's multiple times down the chain. So I, I don't understand how they think the people in charge think that this is this is good because it's multiple accounting 
of one thing. Stepping back and looking at the big picture, do you think the people pushing this really think that they're going to prevent uh, Canada from getting too hot? Or are they actually trying to destroy Western civilization? You know, in my research that I've done on the larger movement, um, because I originally started my research into trying to understand the attacks on the oil and gas industry that that I saw back in 2010, 2011. Um, and that came out of a conference that I had attended where I heard some things that blew me away and I thought, I better research more on this issue. Um, and I tried to raise the alarm back in 2011 that that there is, there's a larger movement that to, in my opinion, seem to be wanting to remove investment from the oil and gas industry in Western countries. So anything that's private, anything that would help Western countries be successful. And, and it was, you know, sort of how, how can you crash civilization? Well, you have to take out the one main thing, which is energy. And um, if they were really serious about wanting to lower global emissions, then you would think the more pressure would be brought to bear on China and India and some of the other developing countries that have no plan to reduce their emissions for the next however many years. So, I mean, there's lots of different reasons why it could be a, why people are supporting the destabilization of Western civilization. Um, but I think it's a lot of disparate groups working together towards that end. Now, what, what will come afterwards? I have no idea. I don't know what they, what I think there's different groups of different plans for what they would like to see. Um, but in this case, by taking away that funding, by taking away that investment, and by forcing everybody to account for all of their emissions, like every individual, um, then that to me, that isn't what Western civilization should be. It's something else. I mean, this does all tie into this whole CBDC thing, too, that if they have all this reporting everywhere, they're going to be able to have a, a digital way for us to uh, to uh, fly once a year or zero times a year. We can't buy as much meat as we want. All that will be tied into this uh, utopian world, right, where everything is accounted for and everybody uh, has to knuckle under to the warrior accountants, whatever they tell us to do, we have to do. Right, right. And one of the interesting things is that for since about 2009, there's been a group in the UK that's really been pushing personal carbon tracking. And so a couple of years ago, this little group put, put together a, a YouTube video about what that would mean. And you would have personal carbon trading. So you'd have a little app on your phone that would tell you what your carbon budget was. And every individual will get a certain amount of carbon budget. And then if someone's being really good and riding their bike around and just staying within their 15 minute city, you could trade, you could buy credits off of them so that your kids could play video games or something. And it was, it was really bizarre, this little video. But the, one of the key people behind it has been pushing this idea since 2009. So I, and there's been various articles coming out in the UK and in nature and communications and so on, where they're talking, they're floating that idea more frequently that maybe we should just have personal carbon trading. Now, one of the interesting things that came out of the last COP is that um, Emmanuel Macron and Mike Bloomberg have partnered together to create the United Nations Net Zero Data Public Utility. Eh, it's a mouthful, I know. Um, but I, the goal behind it is that all of the data that will be generated by countries that um, mandate the ISSB standards, all of that data will go into that one central database. It will be open to the public and it will be free. And one of the key stakeholders that they mentioned should have access to this and could utilize it are ENGOs. Now, why would they need that access to that data? And Mike Bloomberg and company said, well, it will be great because they will hold the companies to account. Well, what does that mean precisely? Well, it goes back to litigation. So a lot of this, if companies aren't doing what they want them to do or aren't, you know, their ESG isn't as good as they, they promised, then this would be a data utility in order to litigate them. And it creates a whole new lever, layer of liability. 
and all that data will be in one place. Because right now you have to go from company to company and, and you'd have to do your research. But this UN net zero data public utility will put it all together in one place. And they're really pushing that it'll be, they'll have a beta version up and running by November. And hopefully for next year, it'll start taking in all of this data. And so you'll have the UN, it'll be headquartered at the UN, um, paid for by the UN or whatever, curated um, and accessible to the world. So if you have a central bank digital currency and you now have all of this data in one place, it allows for far greater control over the allotment of carbon credits or whatever to each individual in a particular country, and then how, how that gets operated. And you can see that these, there's these different building blocks being cure, created as a sort of architecture or framework, which within, because they want this all operational and functioning by 2030. So, you know, seven years to, to get this all working. That brings up a, a quote over here. One researcher calls for an honest con conversation about net zero because, quote, a certain degree of eco-dictatorship will be necessary if we want to achieve climate neutrality. Uh, if we don't voluntarily make the uh, drastic lifestyle changes, a climate lockdown might be needed. So how do you think that's going to go over with voters, though? I mean, if if voters were given the opportunity and it was presented honestly to people, I, th I believe the majority of people would say, no, uh, we don't want this. This isn't what we signed up for. This, there, there's one thing to be said for looking out after the environment. I think everyone agrees that we want to have clean air, clean water. And I would argue we do have that already. Um, it's improved significantly since the 1970s. Um, and is this a, an area where uh, organizations are looking to remain relevant? <laughs> like, I, you know, pristine in the sense of no people doing anything is 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 that one of the goals? I think there's some people who do um, sort of look in that direction, but I think there's other people who are trying to make money off of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of these governments are ne are are not being honest with the public on what this means, what uh, what the ultimate um, implications are for people, and what's required. There's been op eds. There's been uh, articles, academic articles in various um, publications and so on that are all suggesting we just need to get used to black uh, brownouts. We need to get used to living like Zimbabwe, <laughs> which was what, and I thought, really? Well, I don't want to be like Zimbabwe um, in terms of electricity, grid instability. Um, but you you kind of hear that creeping into the into the narrative or the rhetoric is that well, if we're truly committed to the planet, if we really want to have net zero, we're just going to have to make some changes. And, you know, some people have been very open in saying this will be a massive transformation. It'll be a great transformation. They never specify what that is, but they say it will be and just leave it open to interpretation. Now, some people are, are, believe that we're just swapping one form of energy for another. But we all know that wind and solar cannot provide the same level of, of energy uh, and electricity stability that we've grown accustomed to. And that is the, the, the principle or premise for a modern technological industrial civilization. So um, it, it makes no sense to me that the, the push for wind and solar is so aggressive. It's regressive in the sense that it uses up way more space. It's an uh, an older technology. It's not an improvement on what we've got. It's actually worse and requires far more minerals, far more mining, uh, far more land use than than what we currently have with natural gas or coal or or nuclear. And what bothers me is that if if people are really serious about net zero, why? Why isn't there uh, a large promotion of nuclear energy? And a lot of the environmental groups are very much against nuclear. Uh, I've heard a few of my guests say that the reason that they are against nuclear is because it works. I, I think that might, <laughs> I think it might be uh, the case. 
Uh, I think in these ISSB standards, you mentioned that uh, if you are uh, in a solar, or wind, or battery company, then there's no provision for asset end of life, retirement, disposal. There's different rules for them. Also, they only need to provide their nameplate energy, not the actual energy produced. So it might be a, yeah. off by a factor of three there. So just <laughs> different rules uh, just because they want to force solar and wind through and don't really care how they do it, evidently. Yeah, that's what it seems like. I mean, one of the interesting things about wind is that um, they don't have to factor in the emissions cost of the foundation, which, you know, the big cement pad or the tower, all they have to account for is the emissions in the nacelle and the blades. So the, the part that is 80% of the emissions profile of a wind turbine does not have to be accounted for. So it's, there's clearly favoritism to shift the investment um, and the support from one industry to another. And one of the, in the, the warrior accountants article that, that you're, that you cited, um, I said the last time the accountants had so much control and power was when Robert McNamara and the whiz kids were running the Vietnam war. And we saw what happened there. Do we really want to be giving accountants that much power to be restructuring our entire economy? Um, I don't think so. Do you think uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for this whole idea that um, we need to do all this stuff because Canada is getting too warm? Do you think that part of it has been sold, that people are buying into changes in their lifestyle because they're so worried about Canada getting too hot? Well, for Canadians, I think that they're being sold that somehow there'll be less extreme weather because this is the narrative that's been building in Canada for the past probably three years or so is that we've had all this extreme weather, forest fires and flooding and, and various other things. And, you know, as a child growing up in, in Saskatchewan in the, in the summertime, it was always hazy because there's always been forest fires. It's not like this is anything new. And for when I was, when I was little, um, the native reserves around us used to burn the grass all the time, every, every summer or every fall. And there'd be massive fires all over the place. So it's it's not like this is new. I don't think it's climate driven. Um, a lot of it is forest management with respect to the fires that, you know, they, there's forest management plans, but every time that governments want to sort of um, manage the forest better, trim out underbrush or something like this, they get various um, court cases from environmental groups or a lot of pressure to leave the forests natural. Well, <laughs> if you leave it natural, there's going to be fires and it's going to be really terrible. And, you know, how equipped are we to deal with that? And with the flooding, I mean, sometimes when you're building a city in a river valley, in a floodplain, there's going to be flooding. So it's a bit exaggerated. And I think that's how, because it's in the press all the time, just this endless narrative that, um, extreme weather is getting worse and Canadians are going to suffer. And if only we did this transition, the extreme weather wouldn't be so extreme and things would be better. But it's always done in very vague terms. So the public gets a vague idea of something and not necessarily uh, thinking about what the reality will be. And that's my point about needing an open, honest conversation about it. Do you think the Canadian the federal government is kind of cheering on the fires? I, I, I can't shake that notion that it's good for business, that if uh, there's fires and there's a little smoke in the air, they seem to be pushing uh, here in the U.S. this narrative that it's dangerous to go outside because there might be a little haze in the air. Uh, it seems like this summer has been way worse, way more propaganda than usual. I don't know if you're seeing that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, but it's I think they're capitalizing on these natural events. And um, like when there, when there was the forest fires in Fort McMurray, which is the home of the oil sands, oh, they, the media went crazy saying, well, this is, um, this is payback, <laughs> you know, this is karma <laughs> that the oil sands are burning, you know, and all this kind of thing. So I, I'm not surprised that they're taking advantage of the situation. You know, if there's, if there's floods in the spring, which there tends to be in the mountains, um, especially if there's late snowfall that backs things up and then the water suddenly melts quite quickly if it if it if 
if it doesn't heat up for for uh, a length of time, then there's then there's flash flooding or flooding or whatever, and um, governments take advantage of that in order to pursue their their own agenda. And in Canada, they're very much committed to the net zero agenda. I mean, the Biden administration is is doing the Green New Deal in the um, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, they just called it something else because Green New Deal had got a bad rap. Uh, but Canada has been doing that since probably 2016. So, you know, we they got clever. The government got clever in rolling out little pieces of legislation. So the, then they, they have one piece of legislation and then maybe six months later, they roll out another one and another one and another one until suddenly at the end of it, it's the Green New Deal. So the, the latest is uh, Just Transition where they want to transition the oil workers out of business. And I guess they'll be employed cleaning off solar panels or something. I don't know, but um, that's the latest thing. And um, there's the the clean electricity standard, which will be negotiated probably in the next six months or so, um, where they're talking, because the provinces have control over electricity generation. But the federal government wants to tell them what they can use to generate that electricity, which is against the Constitution. But they're going to try anyway. <laughs> you know, If they can get the provinces to the table to negotiate, then suddenly the federal government has all this power. Um, but they want to tell the provinces that are using coal that they can't use coal anymore. And that by 2030, if they're still using coal, they'll go to jail, which is crazy. But so the one premier said, well, if it means the difference between keeping the lights on and going to jail, I guess I'm going to jail. Yeah, he said, come get me, right? He said, come get me. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, solar power. Is is there a push for solar in Canada? And if so, uh, is anybody cleaning the snow off those panels? Because here in Minnesota, I see the solar panels covered with snow. I've never seen uh, anyone out there trying to uncover. Or I think uh, nobody really cares. They just wait for spring if they need to. I think so. I, you know, I'm not really sure how they operate the solar farms in Western Canada, but the the plan that Ottawa often talks about, which is the federal government, is that um, Alberta and Saskatchewan, which are the two prairie provinces and are the big oil and gas producers, just need to cover their fields with solar panels and windmills. And the natural resources minister was in Saskatchewan last week signing all kinds of agreements to give money away to build solar farms on Indian reservations. So um, there's there's a push to do that. And then I was thinking, but Alberta and Saskatchewan is where a lot of the food is produced. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the grain belt and they want to cover the grain belt with solar panels. And I'm thinking, so how are they going to grow the food if you're covering it all with, with solar panels? But um you're right. I'm not sure how they clean them off in the wintertime. I know that there's times when their nameplate capacity is something, but they're only producing 2%. So, you know, in the northern latitudes, it doesn't seem to make much sense to, to have solar panels. You, you just can't assume that there's any common sense or practicality in this green energy push, right? Like you mentioned covering good farmland with solar panels. Does anybody on the green side think, you know, we, we shouldn't be doing that? That doesn't make any sense. It seems like I, I don't see any sign of common sense. Do you see it? No, I see lots of contradictions. So on, on the one hand, there's lots of talk about a circular economy and that they want to be able to not use as much resources to have a minimal footprint, minimal use of minerals and materials and so on. But on the other hand, as I said, there are, they want to invest in wind windmills and solar panels, which are massive, um, and, and electric vehicles, which use up so many minerals and materials, um, a lot of which can't be recycled yet. So for example, with the, the wind turbines, those massive composite blades, they're just burying them. I've seen the, the, the little graveyards in, in the Northern United States there where they just dig these big pits and and bury the, the blades. And with the solar panels, again, there's really no way to recycle those properly. So on the one hand, they're talking about circular economy, we need to recycle everything, but this energy they want us to invest in at this point can't be recycled. 
And with the electric vehicles, you have the batteries, and those are very difficult to recycle. Now, I, I'm I'm all for innovation, and maybe there's there's an opportunity for those innovators to try and figure out the best way to do that. Um, but is that really the best way of using our resources to invest in all this mining and all this material production when it doesn't produce the reliable energy that we need and doesn't last as long, breaks down a lot as Siemens Gamesa um, is having troubles right now. And um, how do you, what do you do with it when the, when it's reached its end of life and those companies don't have to account for it? How about this other contradiction about how anytime indigenous people are opposing a pipeline is kind of case closed, we have to listen to the indigenous people. But you pointed out that there are hydrocarbon projects that are backed by the local indigenous people, but then they kind of throw that out the window and we still have to oppose it. Right. So um, Coastal Gas Link is one. Um, there's a majority of indigenous people who support it. And there's an indigenous consortium that has um, bought into the project. So they're going to be getting a lot of the, the revenue generated from that project will go to these native groups. And then there's like three indigenous groups that oppose it. And suddenly, as you say, they're the poster child for, we, well, this can't go forward because these three groups are objecting, even though there's more than 20 who support it. You know, all along the route, it was supported. There's two new... Um, natural gas export facilities on the West Coast that are majority run by indigenous groups and they got approval. So it'll be interesting to see um, uh, how they how they run the pipelines to those areas and and if there's going to be pushback or or, or what will happen. But uh, that one is wood fiber and I, I can't remember what the um, what the other one is called, but there, there's significant indigenous support, and it's the same in the oil and gas developments in Alberta and Saskatchewan and British Columbia, that there's development happening with indigenous participation and partnership, um, and it receives almost no coverage in our, in our national media. You know, it gets ignored, but the squeaky wheel who's opposing something and they lock themselves to things or sabotage things, that gets all the attention. So. It's really so, unfortunate. You you did mention that there was a coastal gas link sabotage that cost a lot of money. It was a pretty big deal. It didn't necessarily get a lot of publicity. And did they ever uh, prosecute anybody or catch anybody or did that just fall by the wayside? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, in 2022, in February, when the trucker protest was happening in Ottawa, uh, a group of uh, protesters sabotaged the camp where um, the, the equipment was, uh, threatened the people, commandeered the equipment, wrecked a lot of stuff. Um, there's been other cases of sabotage along the line or hints of it and so on. Um, and the RCMP said, we're investigating, we're investigating, and they've got no suspects. And some of the people were bragging on Twitter and on chat rooms about the stuff they did. But apparently the RCMP can't find any suspects. So the investigation is ongoing and, and the media hasn't covered it. So there was a blurb when it happened and I spoke to um, Stuart Muir from uh, Resource Works who is very familiar with uh, Coastal Gas Link and the things going on in British Columbia. And you know he said, this is just another example of that, the sort of, uh, escalation of violence amongst protesters. And, you know, we had David Suzuki, who was counseling people last year, I think it was, to blow up pipelines. And then you have Andreas Malm, who wrote the book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And then they made a movie about it, released it earlier this year around Earth Day or something. Um, and and so there's this escalation happening that if, if um, protesters don't get what they want, which is to put us all back in the Stone Age or something, um, they're going to start taking more violent actions. And that isn't good for a democratic society either. Kind of a two-tier justice, don't they refer to that? Yeah. And it, I mean, I live in the UK and we see Just Stop Oil activists who block streets or slow walk down the street, which is illegal. And the police um, intervene to make sure people don't stop them. 
So there'll be truck drivers or kids going to school who are like, can you just clear off the road? And they'll start to pull the signs away from the just stop oil activists. And the police will intervene and stop the people who, <laughs> you know, from, from trying to stop the just stop oil guys. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's a two tiered system going on. Um, and one can speculate on why that is, but it's, that's not good either. Cause it then makes people believe that there, that this, there's something wrong with the system when it shouldn't be that way. So on another topic uh, you wrote about is net zero putting Canadians pensions in jeopardy. They, uh, I think they invested $300 million in octopus energy boasting on its website that we, <laughs> uh, we've never made a profit. So, um, yeah. How popular is that with pensioners? Do they know that this is happening? Do they want this? Uh, they, pen- they have no idea it's happening. And that's what's so sad is that we have um, with the Canada Pension Plan Investment Fund, they do this great sustainability report. They talk about how they're they're doing all this sustainable investing and so on. And the octopus energy issue, um, when the energy prices spiked last year, and then they put a uh, price controls on, there was another company that has about four years on octopus energy. So they, um, it's called Bulb. And they were doing something similar where they were investing in all of this renewable stuff and saying the energy they're providing to customers is green and so on. And they had grown quite significantly, really quickly. And then they went bust. And so the government took it under control, the UK government, and then said, we'll take bids from you other companies to purchase their customers. So um, Octopus Energy put in a bid and some of the other big uh, energy providers did. And in the end, the government gave it to Octopus because they were promised a whole bunch of money from, I I think it's called Generation Invest, which is Al Gore's investment company, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Fund. Um, And so the, the UK government also said they would backstop it. So I don't know what kind of negotiations were going on in the, in in the background. Um, But there's these institutional investors that had pumped a lot of money into octopus energy in order to be green, to have their green credentials or whatever, to to upgrade their sustainability scores or whatever. Um, But as I is pointed out in the article, if you go to the octopus energy website, it brags, it literally brags, we've never made a profit. We're here for the people. Um, and, and and I'm thinking, do your investors know that you've never made a profit and you probably won't, um, I, they seem to expand a lot, but I don't know when they're ever going to turn a profit. And the, what I heard from the Canada pension plan investment fund and other venues was that they're in long-term, they're there for the long-term. And so even though maybe they're not making money right now, they're in it for the long haul. So 10, 20 years from now, all will be good. And I'm thinking, at what point do the subsidies run out? And you know, 10 years from now, those pensioners who think they're going to be able to draw that money, maybe it's not going to be there. So what kind of jobs do these uh, pen- pensioners have? Is it just all federal workers? So what? no, the Canada Pension Plan is something that every citizen pays into. Every citizen pays into it. And that money goes into this investment fund, which is then managed and um, invested all over the world. And about 15, 20 years ago, the majority of that money was invested in Canada. So the Canadian Pension Investment Fund was investing in Canada. But over the past 15 years, it's been diminishing to the point now where only 14% of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Fund is invested in Canada, which kind of raises a couple of questions. Number one, what is their long-term view of the Canadian economy that they're not investing in Canada? It could be an indication that maybe their planners are, think that the Canadian economy is, is not very robust and will not be able to provide a return 10 to 15 years down the road. Um, The other issue it raises is that there's all of these other innovative opportunities perhaps around the world. But if you look at where this significant amount of fund investment goes, the United States, a lot of the banks that collapsed, um, the tech funds and so on, various sustainability things, and then a significant chunk in China and Asia. 
So we have the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Fund investing in companies operating in China um, and Asia rather than Canadian companies, which you know can put your future retirement at risk. So the money that's being put into these uh, politically correct investments, though, it's coming from people like janitors or whatever people who have real jobs and they're hoping that uh, when they retire, the money is going to be there. Do you think the people doing this investing are um, taking their duty seriously or w which is more important, making sure that the money's there at the end or uh, being politically correct now? I'm wondering about that. Well, I think a lot of the people in charge truly believe what they're doing is right. And that has been a problem forever with humanity is that good intentions get can blind what you're doing. And I think they believe, they truly believe that this will be beneficial 10 years from now. Um, and they run all kinds of scenario analysis and climate risk analysis and so on. And all those models tell them this is the way to go. So they kind of put it off to modeling. The modeling is telling us that these are the right investments to do. Plus, it, it fits in with our, our worldview and we're saving the planet. And, and this will all be great for people down the road. Um, so I would never want to say that, that, that they have nefarious motives. I, I truly believe they believe this is the right thing to do. Um, but as some of your other guests have talked about climate modeling, well, now we have climate risk modeling. And it's the the whole garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you if you're not putting the right variables in, if you don't have the right criteria, then what 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 are you getting at the end of it? So if they're in their climate risk analysis, if they're putting in variables that they want to see a certain outcome, then that can also be skewing the results to some extent because it because it suits their their predisposed idea of what they want to be happening. How is your work being received? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, I, I do get feedback. I get asked to speak to different groups privately just to sort of let them know um, the state of the of the bigger picture. Because I'm I'm interested not just in these specifics, but what it means on for for the society as a whole and what what the sort of global issues are and whatnot. So it's it's very gratifying to be asked to speak about these things and and just to raise awareness for people. So um, there's, there's lots of other speakers out there like Robert Bryce and David Blackman has done some amazing stuff and Irina Slab and everyone. And, and I'm just happy to add my voice to that. The more people speaking out about this, the better I think that, that the public can try to at least engage their politicians to say, we would like a conversation on this issue before it goes too far. And I think we're getting to the point where we could be going too far and it needs to sort of slow down do a rethink, reconsideration before it is too late. Any other points you'd like to make before we wrap up this one? Uh, no, I, <laughs> I've i talked a lot. I'm sorry. Um, I know that a lot of this ESG stuff can be very complicated. And sometimes I think it's intentionally so that people get confused by all of these different acronyms. I've heard it called an alphabet soup or whatever. Um, but I, I highly recommend just taking a look at my little report if you want to know more, um, check out my website, thenemuthreport.com, where I, I put all my uh, op-eds. Uh, I have a podcast that I do where I interview people. I also do a weekly podcast called the Energy Transition Podcast with uh, David Blackman, Irina Slav, uh, Armando Cavana. And we talk about the sort of things going on in the news every week, which is kind of fun. Um, so please check out those things. And um I hope your your listeners, viewers find some of this information helpful and useful. All right. Thank <laughs> you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Tammy Nemeth. We'll talk to you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.